All right, y'all. So we hope midterms went well. You know, happy end of week six. Uh, we hope that uh, you're doing well. Congratulations on getting lab four in. We know that was a pretty difficult one, understanding all the signal processing, but good job. Um, we have our IEEE Among Us social this Friday at 7 p.m. And next Tuesday, we're going to be doing surface mount uh, device soldering workshop. Well, we're not going to do it. Jackie and Travis are. Um, another reminder, GB takeovers um, are going to be happening every Saturday at 7 p.m. If you don't know what that is, basically one of the GBs and IEEE is going to host a social every Saturday at 7 p.m. So turn up. It's a good time. You know, last uh, last week we did, um, what was it, Agario and Agario. the week before. Yeah, and the week before that was Jeopardy. Um, we got some good ones planned. So, um, you know, come out to those. And just as a future note, y'all are doing really well on labs, but if you can, please turn in your lab on time. Um, yeah. And with that, we will start our lecture on FPGAs. Oh, yeah, FPGAs. So, you know, first, you know, what's the hype about FPGAs? Like it's kind of a really cool buzzword these days. And obviously we're using one instead of like an Arduino or Raspberry Pi or something. Um, so like why are FPGAs so cool? Well, you know, it's because, you know, sometimes life really sucks. And if you're trying to make a circuit and it doesn't really, it doesn't do what you want it to do, you have to like actually go back and change it. Um, God forbid you print it on a PCB and it doesn't work and you have to go back and print a new one. And uh, in general, it takes a lot of time and money to change like physical hardware, physical circuitry. And, you know, obviously when you're prototyping, uh, that can be pretty bad because it can end up being very time consuming and uh, costs a lot of money as well. Uh, so that's where FPGAs come in. Uh, it stands for Field Programmable Gate Arrays. Or, you know, I guess it's on the next slide, but uh, it stands for field programmable, field programmable Gate Arrays. And that, that basically means it's like a circuit that you can program on the spot. It's really cool. And it lets you make a lot of really diverse, complex circuits very, very quickly. And instead of like going back, um, say like your breadboard and just like looking, like making sure like you plugged in everything properly, you just have to change a few lines of code and you have a completely, completely new circuit. And uh, FPGAs are a great way to, um, to do rapid prototyping and you can you know, make sure your initial early stage version works uh, before you transfer onto um, a more permanent uh, platform like a PCB or like an ASIC or something. And uh, you can use FPGAs in like a wide variety of applications. Um, you know, one of these applications, you know, audio speech playback, uh, we're going to be doing that spring quarter with the mics and also digital signal processing. I'm sure you all uh, love it by now. And there's a lot of other imaging, video applications, uh, wireless communication, you can use it as a radio, as a data server. Uh, a lot of people use it for hardware emulation. So like low level embedded systems, uh, you can run a neural network on it. Uh, they're pretty crazy, pretty powerful. So uh, that's why, you know, FPGAs are really cool. And if you tell someone like a recruiter or something that like, you know how to use FPGA, that's good looks on you. Yeah, another thing, I uh, got a little special Christmas gift this year from Mr. Travis Grading um, about and making an FPGA chess engine. So that's another thing you can do with it. All right, moving on. So just some FPGA basics. You may remember this little set of steps that we described, I think, in our first or second lecture. This is basically the entire FPGA design process. So first you have synthesis and then simulation. And then you're, you're probably familiar with those. After that is place and route, timing analysis, and post-programming. So synthesis, you know, this is something y'all are pretty familiar with by now. It's basically um, describing a, a very simple circuit behavior using hardware description languages like Verilog or VHDL. And basically when you press synthesize, the compiler um, checks your code, makes sure it's valid, but then it also creates a net list. So every like variable you've been 
uh, creating is basically a net. And so it goes through the code and it um, makes sure that every net is connected and tries to just connect all the designs in a name of netlists. Um, that's kind of why when you run synthesis and then you run your simulations, sometimes it passes synthesis, but it doesn't pass the simulations because it can create a netlist. It can like say these two must be connected, but it doesn't have, it doesn't first create the logic of how should they be connected. So next is simulation, also one of your favorites. It's where you basically test your code before you put it on the hardware. And so you, you know, make your test cases and you can do all the general situations, but you can also do the edge cases. And you just um, you look at your waveform to see if the logic for your code is correct. And it's really important that you do this before you put it on the hardware because it's a lot easier to see that this is correct rather than to uh, put it on the FPGA and think, oh, it's not working. Maybe it's my, a broken FPGA. And then it turns out it's just you did your code wrong. So if you don't know how to do this by now, please come talk to us. You know. All right. So then place and route. Um, so after your, co your code has like gone through rigorous testing, you run place and route. And basically, Cordis or whatever IDE you're using for your specific FPGA has a little algorithm that goes through the netlist and tells it how to um, create the circuits from the netlist. So whether that be from create, making an AND gate or a register or something really complex like a whole CPU, you know, it just kind of has this algorithm that tells it how to assign it. So that's the next step. And then there's timing analysis. Um, timing analysis really isn't that important for what we're doing and the project we're doing. Um, it's basically to make sure that your setup and hold times, which are specific to your registers, are met um, when you're making really complex circuits. Maybe there's really long paths that the wires have to go, and so they might the electrical signals not, might not get there in time. And so this is kind of important to make sure that um, the code will work on the FPGA, not due to physical restrictions. Um, like we said, it's not really important for our reasons. It's more of an application specific. And then there's post programming. So there could still be bugs in your hardware that happen even after you simulated. But um, for what we've do it, what we've done, we've tested it enough times that it should work as long as your code has worked. Um, that's why it's important to simulate first before you uh, do post programming debugging because it's pretty hard to do uh, post programming debug debugging because it's hard to see. Any questions? burning questions about the internals of the FPGA. Also, this is the same meme as earlier. I'm sorry, everyone. All right, well, if not, I guess we're gonna go ahead and talk about our FPGA. Our FPGA, D10 Lite, pretty cool board. And, you know, we got a nice discount on that. Uh, but first, you know, a note uh, about data sheet. I know uh, we had everyone read the data sheet for the first lab, and some people were better or worse at doing that. And I know, you know, reading the data sheet is really hard and annoying and tedious. Um, but you know, you got to do it. And the data sheet for our board has, you know, a lot of really interesting and uh, detailed technical information. Has a lot of really nice pictures and diagrams of like uh, the internal hardware of the FPGA and uh, what's actually happening inside it. And uh, for this lab, you're you're gonna have to read the data sheet to to know how to operate uh, all the parts in the FPGA. You know, and uh, you know it's kind of. Uh, a fact of life. Like you're gonna to have to read data sheets at some point. So um, you know, you should practice now. All right. So one of the first features on our FPGA is two sets of buttons and they're push buttons. If you did the last lab and you got checked off, you should know how these buttons kind of work. They're active low which means that when you press them, the voltage actually gets short, shorted to ground. And so they have a low voltage when you press them. And then when you release them, you have a high voltage. Um, you know, that's why for our reset button on our FFT module, we set reset equal to zero instead of being one. 
And then if you have been through ops, you probably know about button debouncing. So you probably remember that when you press a button, it doesn't just smooth, it doesn't naturally just smoothly go up or smoothly go down. It goes through like rapid jumps. And so luckily, you don't have to debounce your buttons because the FPGA provides a little uh, circuit that actually debounces it for you as long as you make sure to set the proper um, logic levels for your FPGA, which is what we'll talk about a little later. So don't worry about debouncing for right now. Well, remember that it exists, but don't worry about it right now. All right, next, switches. There's 10 switches on the FPGA. They do exactly what you think they do. Like if they're down, it's zero. If it's up, it's one. You physically like flip the switch to like change its value. And uh, you should probably look at the data sheets and make sure like down is, is, is what you think it is and not the, the other way around. My bad, I was muted. Next, you've got a set of LEDs. You've got 10 user-defined LEDs, which basically means like 10 LEDs that you can control and program. And then you have four status ones. And the four status LEDs are basically there to make sure that your FPGA is in the correct state, like it's programmable and configured well. But the user-defined ones, that's something you can um, set yourself with your own logic. Um, if you don't know where they are, they're kind of hard to see. They're just like right above the switches. Like if you uh, go back, like if you, you were to imagine these switches on the FPGA, it would be like right in a situation like right above them. Um, Basically, of course. So where those letters are. Yeah, essentially. Um, and so when you set the LEDs to high, they turn on. And when you set them to low, um, they turn off. Simple and easy like that. OK, seven segment display. Um, if you've never seen one before, looks like this. But I'm sure you have. Uh, there are six of these on the FEGA. And hilariously, I think they have eight pins instead of for the seven segment display. And uh, yeah, literally all you do is if you want the segment to light up, you you make it you make it you give you give the pin a one. And uh, yeah, I think that's that's all there is to it. All right, so next we're gonna get to clocks, and clocks are pretty important. So you remember like for some of your previous sequential logics, you used your test bench and you made an always loop that was like delay 10 seconds and then flip your clock, right? Well, that's not actually going to be how it works. You're not actually putting your test bench on your, um, on your FPGA to make the hardware. The clocks are inherent to the FPGA. And so you can see there's this clock generator that um, basically outputs a 10 megahertz clock and two 50 megahertz clocks to your system. Um, the 10 megahertz clock is usually used for um, analog to digital conversion. And then the 50 megahertz clocks are just um, kind of outputs for you to use there. And uh, for now, we're going to use 50 megahertz as your basic system clock, which is why if you want to drive something only every second, you need your clock dividers. That's why we were pushing that on you so that you really understood, because that's how, because you can't just uh, ask the FPGA for one hertz clock. You need to make it a clock divider for you. Next, uh, the FPGA also has GPIO expansion headers. Um, if you have ever used like a Raspberry Pi before, you might have worked with these before. Uh, they're basically just input output pins, like just for whatever you want, basically. And you can connect uh, other devices uh, to the FPGA using the GPIO headers. So, I mean, for us, we're gonna be connecting our microphone down the road uh, with our GPIO headers. Um, if you actually wanna use them, you should look at the pinout in the data sheet because some of the pins are actually like ground or power, uh, you know, so don't make sure you don't mess that up. And um, the FPGA also has, our <clears throat> our, sorry, Arduino headers. Uh, your old friend, Arduino, and um, it's got, a Arduino Uno compatibility, and it has uh, you know analog pins. You can do ICC, radio stuff, um, and the pinouts on the data sheet as well. So uh, yeah, if you want to use the Arduino pins, then yeah, make sure you look at the pinout for that as well. All right. So the next really 
cool, useful thing that our FPGA has is like special sets of RAM blocks. So if you don't know what RAM is, RAM is basically um, just like registers, it's used for storing data. Um, the reason you use RAM instead of registers is that RAM um, is it, it's more dense. And so you can store more values per space in a specific block of RAM than you can with just a large set of registers. And so um, the FPGA has a limited number of registers on the board that you can program. And so after a while in, with a large number, with a really complicated program, um, you're going to run out of those registers. And so it's best for like large storage things that where you're basically just reading and writing to try and use RAM, which will be um, more scalable to larger projects. And then you can use registers for more like basic logic circuits, um, inputs and outputs and stuff. Um, RAM, if you think about it on a computer, it's generally slower than registers because the circuitry is more complex. And so it takes more time to read and write. But for our purposes on an FPGA, um, that's pretty negligible. So uh, using the RAM on the board is a little tricky um, because the way this works is that you have to write your Verilog code in a very specific way um, for the place and router to understand that you want to use the RAM block. So luckily, Cordis gives us a template to use um, to make sure our code is correct. So you can see if you make a new file in Cordis and then you click Edit, Insert Template, you'll find this window. And under System Verilog you'll, and Full Designs, you'll find this section called RAMs and ROMs. And so you have all these different templates that you can use for, uh, for um, uh, making RAM. For this, you can see some are dual port, which basically means you can write and read two values at the same time. Um, some are different widths, some are just byte enabled. Um, for this project, we're going to be talking about mixed width port RAM, um, which basically means you could have different read or write widths, um, and you only have a single port for input or output. So this RAM template looks a little confusing, so we're going to try, try and break it down a little bit. You can see right here we have these three parameters, words, RW and WW. So RW um, is basically the width or the number of bits for the data you are reading out. Um, so you know if you have a port and you want to read some data, it could be one bit, two bit, three bits. Um, so if you want it to be eight, bit, eight bits of output, you would set RW to eight. Um, for WW, that's the number of bits when you are writing data. It, for this template, they could be different, but for our purposes, um, they will be the same. So for example, if RW is eight, input with WW should also be eight because we're just going to be writing and reading the same size data. We also have words, um, which basically means the number of addresses you can index into or the number of values you can store. And then we have WE, this input right here, and clock. You should know, probably know what clock is. WE is write enable. Um, whenever you want to write data instead of reading data, you would set write enable to high. Then you have W address, W data, read address, and Q. And basically, W address is your address. Imagine RAM like a, like a set of, uh, like an array of registers. Um, whatever your W address is, is your index into your array. And then W data is the data you are writing into that index. R address is the index you want to read from. And Q is where the output um, comes from. And you, you see these generate statements. Um, you don't really have to worry about what they, what they really do. Um, basically, what's going to happen for this is going to call right here. And basically, what happens is if write enable is high, it's going to access the RAM at W address and write in W data. Otherwise, it's going to, or simultaneously, it is also going to um, look at send Q. Uh, set Q as the value of RAM at the read address. So you can read and write at the same time, essentially. Are there any questions about RAM? It's a, I know it's a little confusing. Hopefully I can explain, I explained it well. Or any of the other components on the FPGA, you know, there, there's a lot of them. FPGA is really powerful, guys. 
And, uh, you know, don't worry about asking questions about RAM. I mean, like last night, I was just asking Brandon, like all these random questions about RAM, like, oh, you know, like, what's the stand for? What's it do? Like, how do you use it? And then Brandon answered all my questions. And now I know what RAM is. And hopefully you will too. Oh, I see something in the chat. Can you eat it? Um, don't. <laughs> also, um, try not, don't download a bunch of extra RAM. Have you tried though? Admittedly, no. No. But, uh, oh, let me get back to you on that. All right. If there's no other questions, we can move on to the next segment. Oh, one more in the chat. Download more RAM.com. All right. You know. All right. What you want to do. Do what you want to do. Yeah. All right. OK. Next, if there's no more questions, we're going to move on to pin planning. OK, this is like an actual like practical component of the lecture because uh, it tells you how to actually map your signals that you define in your, your Verilog file to actual pins on the FEGA, which like is very important. So first, you got to open the pin planner. So on the top bar, like all those little icons, it's the third one. If you hover over it, it says pin planner, very helpful. Uh, and then you, you click it and you get uh, this window, this screen. Well as another note, it's also somewhere under assignments. If you click here, you can find pin planners, just as another note. Yes. And you, you open it and you get the screen. Wow, so much going on here. OK, but you know, I'm going to break it down like piece by piece. You know, first, at the top, you see top view, wire bond, max 10, the name of your device. If this doesn't work, uh, you're not going to be able to synthesize to your device because it's specific to your particular FPGA. So the reason why, you know, like in the first lab, we wanted everyone to get the right device is because it doesn't work otherwise. Um, David, I have a question. Yes. Isn't our device the 10M50DA F484, as you said? Yeah, it is. But, you know, I was kind of messing around last night. <laughs> <laughs> you don't do as I say, not as I do. This is not the name of the device. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, and then on the right, there's a legend of all the, of what all the pins mean. And the pins are mapped out in the center of the screen. It's this big grid, this big square grid of all these pins on the FPGA. And at the edge of the grid, you can see numbers and letters. Uh, that's a coordinate system for naming the pins. So you can say like, oh, plug this into pin A2, or, you know, like, Y19 or whatever you want. Um, yeah, and then so at the bottom of the screen, you have that list. It's a list of all the input and output signals uh, that uh, have come from your design. So, you know, obviously your design, you specify your inputs and outputs uh, in your module and you'll see a list of all the signals here. Uh, and then on the left side, you there's a little window right now it says report but if you go see there's tab groups um you can see all the nodes and make new ones in groups so if you happen to you know you want to make a new node and uh connect two nets together uh for some reason you can make that you can make it there and also if you run analysis and synthesis uh then you'll have uh, groups made for you and it'll know what the group should be Another benefit of like having these groups is like if you want to make um, kind of a big chain, you know, like you could have multi bit um, variables. And so if you want to make a change to all the bits at once, instead of like having to go one by one, then it's nice to do that in the groups as opposed to yeah, one by one. Okay, then uh, uh, so this is a close up of all the pins. Obviously, you know, it looks very busy and um, like the pins don't actually have any meaning until you look at the data sheet and you find out like which pin actually corresponds to which thing. 
And uh, generally, you're going to be mapping to the pins like to have an N or a P on them. That's just from personal experience. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, then uh, to actually assign the pins, uh, first you got to look at the data sheet, of course. I'm like stressing this a lot because it's very important. And uh, so you go, you see, you, you go to the table where it tells you what all the pins mean. And let's say I want to assign uh, one of my outputs to uh, the first LED, so LED zero. And so in the second column, it'll tell you the FPGA pin number, so pin A8. So you should go to uh, at the bottom of the screen where it said all of the inputs and output signals. You go, you look to, you look for your signal. So if right now I have F0 and I want to map to LED0. So you click location and you type in pin A8. Wow, very, very, very intuitive, right? And then also on the in the data sheet, it'll tell you the IO standard. So that's basically uh, the voltage you need. And for this, it says 3.3 volts LVTTL. So you so in the same line, you go to IO standard and you click it, and there's going to be a drop down menu, and you just change it to whatever it says on the on the data sheet. Uh, then when you actually um, assign a, a signal to a location. So here I've assigned F0 to pin A8. It'll actually change uh, on the map of the pins above. So here, you know, pin A8, uh, it's, it's, it's colored now. Yeah. And uh, one note about buttons, uh, you know, naturally buttons are gonna be your inputs, but also uh, buttons have a different IO standard than basically everything else. So, you know, don't forget. Oh, and then after you assign all your pins, you got to compile your design again. Uh, just so, you know, when you actually try to synthesize, uh, the, compile, the, the synthesizer can, you know, tell the FPGA what's mapped to what. Any questions so far? All right, so then after you've done that, you program your FPGA. So you've got, basically after you've done the recompile, you've got all your files ready to program your FPGA. You next go to your programmer. It's also, you can click on this button right here. That's above your, above your like window of designs. It's also somewhere like below here. It'll say like um, program device or something like that. You can click either of those. Then when you put, click that button, you get this beautiful screen. And there's a lot of information on here, but we'll, you know, we'll break it down. So the first thing you'll kind of see at this, at this top is this hardware setup. It says USB blaster right here. Your FPGA comes with a USB-A to USB-B cable. The USB-B is on the FPGA, the USB-A hopefully is on your computer, unless you have only USB-C, then you'll need like a dongle. Um, basically your method of, this is your method of programming the FPGA. Um, if you don't see this, it's probably because you don't have your USB plugged in um, before you opened up the programmer. And so you would have to um, plug it in. You would click hardware setup here. If you open the programmer first, you'd have to plug in your USB, click hardware setup here, and it should show up and you can choose it. Right here, you see this kind of set of fi files. Again, you see the name of the device. You see a few other things and you click, and this box right here, program slash configure should already be checked. Um, this um, file output file is in a folder that's automatically generated by Cordis. This should be kind of your project name, um, .sof file. There's also a .pof file, but the .sof is enough uh, for what we're doing. And this is the file that basically gets put onto the board. Um, if you wanna change that, you would look at this little diagram here, which is your FPGA's basic chip, and you would right click on that. There's a button that says change file, and you can change file to like the .pof. But um, again, as we said, this is pretty, uh, the default that um, pulls up should already be good enough for you to use. Um, right here on the left, you'll see this start button, and that's what you actually do to take the file and upload it to your FPGA. So you press that button, to start the upload. And right here in this progress bar, you'll see the status of the upload. 
Um, it basically has this blank state, but it could also be green or red, obviously success or failure. And if it's a failure, it typically means you did something wrong um, with making your project. So like choosing the wrong board um, when you made your project so that, and then it doesn't know how to actually program your board. So make sure you get a green here. And if you get a red, it might be something kind of, so it might be a silly error. Any questions? All right, well, then if, that's, if there's no questions, then we'll be releasing lab five either tonight or early tomorrow. The first checkpoint, we're, this should be a pretty short, simple lab. You're just gonna play with some of the hardware. Um, obviously there's not a lot, there's not a lot to work with, but we, you know, you get a little bit more experience with every checkpoint. So the first uh, set of checkpoints is due Wednesday. Um, and the second set is due next Sunday, you know, get hyped. You get, you actually get to play with your toys now, you know, this is fun. You know, this is why you join DAV. Hopefully you get to play with a few toys and see what programming for an FPGA is like. Um, also, please don't break them because they are very expensive. We got a discount, but they are very expensive. And you don't want to have to pay for broken boards. All right. Any questions about anything whatsoever? You know, we just talked about a lot of stuff. We went over, you know, the, ra the rationale behind FPGAs, uh, the design process, development process, what's on the FPGAs. RAM specifically, it's very, um, it's a little arcane because uh, the data sheet doesn't actually explain RAM that well. And we also explained uh, how to actually synthesize it onto your FPGA. So anyone, questions? Comments, concerns, violent reactions? All right. All right. Sounds good. I will stop recording. <laughs>